Adams Memorial Membership Award, which he just received moments ago down the hall. This award is sponsored by AWS and recognizes educators for outstanding service activity, teaching, I'm sorry, outstanding teaching activities in their undergraduate and postgraduate engineering institutions. And so, uh, <laughs> Professor Suresh Babu from the Ohio, Ohio State, State University okay. will present uh, for us this afternoon. Thank you, Suresh. Thank you. Okay. I have around 30 minutes, so, okay. Let me, uh, good afternoon, thanks for coming. So, what I would like to do today is, you heard on the Plummer lecture about research is education, education is research. So, I'm going to pick up from that uh, thread and then move forward on that. Uh, this particular um, time, I'm going to talk about graduate uh, in welding engineering education. So, how we can go to the next level by collaborating with uh, industry. So that's what my focus of the program. If you don't know, this is the welding engineering, I'm part of the welding engineering program at the Ohio State University. So I'd like to talk about outline of my talk is essentially on the current status, what we are right now with reference to graduate uh, welding engineering. And then what are the needs of the industry? How do we go about bridging the gap? And then um, if I, I want to talk about in a uh, passing on the case study with additive manufacturing, but I won't be showing some results on that. And then the future directions where we want to go. Okay, um, traditionally all uh, welding engineering um, progress you made in the process, you may relate back to some of the work, fundamental research done in universities. So I, I don't have a movie here. Uh, this is a magnetic pulse welding where you're actually joining a, a tube to another internal tube by propelling this at a high speed. And then you get this impact welding and then you can make a very good solid state bonds in it. So the, the pioneering work was done in universities and now being applied in industries also. So I can give, go along on and on about different examples where how different processes made it into the practice. But one of the biggest questions which we always face is, okay, so what are the things which you have done in the, uh, by educational research in undergraduate level? If you go and do a little bit of uh, research in all the publications done in the last 20 or 30 years and then look at them, you will see montage of activities ranging from processes, materials, performance as well, and how do we control? In addition to that, there are some interesting work in medical field also, welding of tissues are also. So you can see that uh, US universities have played a critical role in it. And all of them have been driven by a lot of fundamental uh, foundations funding this work for NSF, National Science Foundation, Department of Energy, Department of Commerce, DOD, and also industries played a big role in it. So this is a huge amount of work. And then if you look at it, who are all contributed in it, and you can see that, um, let me go back. So Penn State, Professor De Bruyne worked quite a lot on computational fluid flow in valves, and you can go through that. Zhang, Professor Zhang works on arc control, valves, arc, arc welding, and you can go through each one of them. They've contributed extensively to different processes, materials, and everything. So these are, you can see them, the quite a lot of uh, pedigree in the research. Now, what's the challenge? So I'm going to see, show that what is happening in the last five years. And we evaluate our productivity by how many amount of publications we do in a welding engineering research or so. So this is a percentage of publication that means total number of publications throughout the world. And then you see what is the percentage of what US universities are doing it. Now you can see that we used to be great. And we are coming down in percentage level and there is a quite a lot of um, competition from other countries. And you can see that uh, China took over all of us five years back. And it's still the trend, even in 2012. The reason is not um, very difficult to understand because there's a lot more investments in going on manufacturing in the countries where the research is um, actually promoted to go and do more work in welding, fusion welding, friction stir welding, all kinds of processes. So this leads to a question, how can we remain still competitive and maintain our edge with that. So the one of the thing is that the government agencies are still going to shrink in our foundation uh, funding of research. So we need to come up with a different ways 
to engage and still remain number one in that. So let me take one example for that. So if you look at the materials for energy industries, right from the batteries right now being used in uh, high, uh, hybrid electric vehicle and electric vehicle all the way to making wind turbines and everything, you can see that welding becomes very, very crucial. So any material, you need to put them uh, together by either by welding or brazing or soldering. So this becomes a, a kind of overarching theme for all applications within energy. So how can we um, go about make sure that we show the relevance and still engage these industries with us? So let me go one step forward into it. So let's talk about one uh, deployment of advanced materials to one application, which is energy efficiency. So around seven years back, um, Governor said that, well, we need to come up with a way to reduce CO2 emissions and then also re reduce the weight and all those things, energy efficiency and everything. So it's, the goal is very known. But the way to go about doing that is the short term is implementation of advanced high strength steels. And then also come up with the multi-material concepts where you would put them put together, uh, polymers and aluminum and steel. So these are the two ways to go about doing it. So solution kind of known, but how are we going to implement it? So I'm going to show you one example with reference to advanced high strength steel, why welding becomes critical. So if you ask a steel industry, what is advanced high strength steel, they will show this curve, which you usually call it as a banana curve. Looks like a banana. So this high elongation, elongation here, and then the tensile strength here. People are moving towards higher and higher strength materials. I'm going to give you one example, which is a trip steel. And if you weld them, you, without welding, you get a very good properties. But when you weld them, the properties of the welded joint, you can see the failure occurs during the heat affected zone, and you get properties much, much poor than original carbon manganese steels to start with. We know, understand that why this kind of thing happens, because when you develop these materials, you're adding aluminum, high levels of aluminum, and that promotes a particular microstructure in the steels, and that leads to the poor properties. So this becomes a real problem. How do I make sure that we minimize these kind of microstructures? So how do we uh, leverage some new processes like laser welding? Yes, indeed, you can actually deploy them with the laser welding. But however, deployment of this takes a lot of trial and error experiment work. So how do we go about addressing this? I told you that laser welding was used. So how do we go about developing the solutions? So I'm going to show you one uh, of how many welding joining processes we have. So if you go to AWS Handbook and then look at that, the, all the welding processes, I think around 70 of them are there. So which one is going to be the good one for advanced resistance steel? So there is no one generic solution. It's usually point solutions, and depends upon um, different uh, exp experience with the different processes to do that. So let me give you one example. If I would have gone to ask, how do I weld advanced high strength steel to my colleagues at EWI or other people who work on this area? So this is what I would need is, hey, I need to weld advanced high strength steel. So immediately we can think about in our head, OK, there are two ways of going it fusion welding or solid state welding, or you can do fasteners. If you ask any one of people who are practicing this, they will always say, well, my process is much better than the other process. So you will see that there is no a generic solution or a solution which is optimal from the perspective of the industries. They want to introduce this so that they can get better high energy efficiency and also high strength, uh, advanced high strength steel in automotive structures. So how do we go about doing this? So this is currently we, we do like this. What would be the ideal? If you ask the industries, this is what they want. They don't care how you weld it. So this is not me talking. This is based on our feedback from our industries. They just want to make sure that who can join advanced high strength steel in a high, high productivity conditions, good quality, and economy. This is the three questions they want to know. And they don't care about whether you come up with the different processes to do it as long as you can meet this. This is not new business solution. For example, when you're traveling, you're using hot wire to come from one place to other place. You don't get one solution. You get multiple solutions. You pick which one is required for you. I wish, before I die, we will have this kind of solution for us. So you can go into a computer, hey, I want to weld advanced high strength steel with this much quality, this is so, and then you get multiple solutions. We should be able to deliver them. But that's what the way we want to go. 
So you must be wondering, what has this got to do with universities? So what can universities do? So we always have been part of this point solution. So I can't weld this, so tell me a solution. So we used to work with them. And there is a generic way of developing science, we have been doing that. But however, as soon as a new material comes in, how do we go about solving this problem? So what we did is around uh, three years back, uh, universities, Ohio State, Lehigh, Wisconsin, Colorado School of Mines, we joined together and asked the industries, what do you need from us? So this is what they said. Well, as soon as the material comes, make sure that it is valuable so that you can bridge the gap quickly so you can deploy the new materials. So most of you may know if we have a new steel to apply it to a, in the Navy application, it takes 20 years. So if you could accelerate that, you can benefit from the new materials. So that's what they wanted. In addition to that, they also said that we always don't need new materials. We would like to extend the life of existing materials. So that's what the next need they said. The third one is that many applications, like going into um, wind energy, sometimes the materials cannot be monolithic. So you can put together in different forms and geometry, and then you can still get better properties. So they wanted to us to focus on this. These were the needs identified by around 35, 40 companies who came to give us feedback on that. But the most important thing, they were all here talking to universities, mainly because they wanted the future of their companies to be staffed by these young students who go through and then play a role in deploying these solutions. That's what they need mostly. These are a vehicle to reach that point. So we talked to a lot of companies in the part of fossil energy, nuclear energy, a lot of 35 our companies came. And then they said that these students should focus on these different six different way, um, technical goals relevant to them. One of them is existing advanced materials. If you have advanced eastern steel, how do I join? How do I join dissimilar materials? How do I join uh, the new hybrid additive manufacturing? How do I put them in uh, our, my applications instead, instead of traditional ways? How do I do that? How do I make sure if I have a part coming out of the surface, how can I make sure the life of those valves are known? So all those things are necessary to do it. So how can you make this happen? So that was the, the question. So the question is, what is necessary to meet those needs? So if you ask a student in the traditional way we are trained each and every, if I, somebody works with me, I'm going to teach them welding mentality. Somebody works with my colleague, Professor Farson, you focus on the process. So we used to be like, like, kind of like a smokestacks, like one, each one working on different areas. But what the industry wanted is not that. They wanted the students to be interdisciplinary. They should be able to be comfortable with talking about design all the way to reliability of wells. So they need to be able to get mentorship from not only from one professor, multiple professors to do that. In addition to that, they also want the students to be relevant to industry way of working, milestone based, how can we deploy the solutions, not never ending, we are doing experiment, experiment, so just make sure that you have an end goal in, in your uh, view to make sure that you can deploy it. So they wanted the students to be comfortable with that. So this is a really, really difficult to do it. How can you do this? Traditionally, you're not about to do that. So, but then you can ask a question, who really cares about this? So right now, within our center, uh, we have around 28 companies, and they're all working with four different universities, and then each project is actually, and student just works on it, on a particular problem relevant to the industries. The, the, one of the ways, this uniqueness of this is that each and every company has an advisor to the student. So they actually kind of every month they tell them about, okay, you're, this direction is okay, this direction is not good, in addition to the faculty mentoring. And this is the way you can engage between the industry and university, and then we can get, make it happen. So, so I'd like to show some examples how we are being relevant to the industries. So I'm going to talk about some of the research topics. And remember, the graduate school education relies on being understanding through research with reference to industry applications. So I'll give you one uh, example. 
Uh, there is a dissimilar materials has to be uh, joined together for an application which goes into your medical devices. So for that, they are interested in doing very fast, way too well, but not because of the productivity requirements. You get a different process to do it. So I would like you to focus on this. In this case, we are putting two materials together when we're shining a laser, and you will see that how fast that gets projected out towards the substrate. So let me play that. So you can see that there was an explosion behind here. It is a very tiny explosion. So it's based on a very minute miniature joints you can make. And when this material gets projected out, there is a substrate here. It'll hit them. And because of that, you get the impact welding. It's kind of like, I would say, miniature scale explosive welding. You can do it in your lab. There's not, not big noise. It's except for the laser hitting the surface. And this is uh, done by my colleague, Professor Glenn Dane, who has been expert on the explosive welding application. So we are deploying this with reference to Medtronics with due advice from their company too. In addition to that, there is a new goal towards additive manufacturing. Um, President Obama just announced uh, Additive Manufacturing Institute in Youngstown, Ohio. It's a very neat process by which you can actually take powders and tapes and then make a near net shape product, similar to multipass welding. But however, there are uniqueness at certain processes, like for example, solid state welding. In this case, we are actually taking tapes of uh, material, and then you're joining them together using ultrasonic seam welding process. You can make a near net shape. In addition to that, we can also embed uh, optical cables and sensors and actuators in it, so it becomes a really um, you can functional material which you can deploy. I'll show you a movie of this. I would like you to watch this. This is a sonotrode, and this is a tape. We are going to be welding that uh, using that process. So let me play that movie. So you can see that the sonotrode will move, and uh, it just rolls over. It's vibrating at 20 kilohertz, and you can see the weld is made. So by repeating this one after another, one after another, we can make a 3D parts. And you can see, you can also go through a little bit of machining time to time, and then you can put complicated cooling channels within one single block. You wouldn't even notice it when you see a block, there is a cooling channel inside. So these kind of innovative processes, the graduate students are working on it so that they can go and deploy them for applications later on. So this is one example of how people work on it. In addition to that, there is another student right now who works for Ford. When he was part of the OSU, he worked on how to weld a new generation of armor materials, which can be high thin and also which can have a good ballistic performance. And this was developed by a, a small business owner from Detroit. And he wanted to understand the fundamentals. And then he also wanted to deploy welding solutions. So he, by himself, he cannot afford to use laser welding. So he worked with OS, Ohio State. And you can see we evaluated when the bullet hits the material. You can see it withstood that, highly good ballistic resistant. And you can see how the impact hardening occurs under the bullet. In addition to that, we welded them using gas metal arc welding. That was poor weld because you can see complete softening expected because we're putting a lot more heat into it. And then we deployed a laser weld for them so that we can minimize the softening in the case of advanced high strength steel. So again, the student works closely with the business and then understands his business needs and also develops technical solutions to it. So I can go on and on like a similar uh, way of developing solutions, how the students work with the industry. The last but not least, I'll tell you about how the students are also learning to deploy advanced computational models to solve industry problems, too. And this is uh, in addition to the additive manufacturing, which I talked about when I told you about solid state. This is uh, like a, using a fusion welding process, where you have a laser welding, you pour um, powders into it, and then you build a layer by layer by layer. This is a very high-end application for repairing gas turbine blades. And then we need to understand the fundamentals of them. And then we should be able to solve some of the problems. It is like a multi-pass weld. You can see this is a substrate. We weld one layer, two layer, three layer, four layer. And you get different hardness in the, the clats. So by understanding this, we can actually deploy better solutions for our, the industry member. OK. So the question is always comes, hey, how do we do this? So remember, this is a group effort. 
where four universities work together and then 28 different companies. So I kiddingly say I have 30 bosses. So everybody asks me to do solve particular issues with reference to them. We work with our faculty, colleagues, and students to do that. How do we do this? So let me walk you through that. We are here. Our primary focus is education. Next comes basic. And then third comes the innovation. Whereas the industry focuses on the innovation, applied research, education is on the lowest for them. They are not interested in educating, but of course they need good amount, good students there. So the IUCRC sits in between them, kind of works as a bridge between these two um, columns there. So the goal is we develop a good relationship between the industry and for a long term. So it's what we need to do. So one of the things which they get, industry gets out of this engaging with us is that they also get new ideas and also they network between them, with the 28 companies coming together, they can network with each other. In addition to that, they get pre-IP also intellectual property. But from a, as a being a faculty, I really get um, excited about it when I see the students get employed right away. So we graduated four students. They got the job before even they graduated. So they are right now working in industries. They sometimes I get an email back saying that uh, I was really, really gra gratitude showing them that by working in this industry center, we can focus on how the industry works. It's not completely surprise for them when they go and go back to work. So that's how the, I use this uh, mechanism works to bridge the gap between them. So as I meant, I have 30 bosses. The two big bosses are here. They are the chair of this whole IAB uh, industrial advisory board on this particular center. They actually make sure that I do my job as a director and also my colleagues do the right job of making sure we meet the needs of the industries too. So this is run by industry. So academia is actually only enablers, but the direction is set by the industries on this. So now you must be wondering, okay, so good. How did we serve the educational mission? So I'd like to point out there are students presenting their work. If you are interested, walk down on the 238, 239, 240 rooms. You can see them. Each one of them is presenting their work. And take part and grill them nicely. See whether they are focusing on industry problems. Okay? So this is at Ohio State. And then some of them have graduated already. Nick went to Caterpillar. Adam is working for Wolf. And then Brian Hunt works for the Ford. You know. And then there's uh, also Colorado School of Mines. Also, they are still uh, in their graduate degree program. Once they complete, I have no doubt they will be employed right away. And you can see there are 28 uh, different researchers going through the center, focusing with industry needs. So as you're all from industry, you all know the most important thing is how do we communicate to the with industries? So this is a very important thing. And so they all actually go through a certain amount of project management. So I had my, one of my colleagues from EWI teach them the basics of project management, how milestone base you have to go. The industry doesn't have patience to just wait forever and ever for the results. They need to work with them, engage with them, communicate with them. So they do that also routinely. Sometimes I'm really surprised. The student will come and say to me, Suresh, we need to complete this milestone. So he actually puts me to work. So that's amazing. So, so in addition to that, this, all the information we generated are available for the industry members, so they get access to them also. OK, so what did I try to do that? Remember the challenge which we started off. The amount of funding from national agencies are shrinking down. If you have to maintain a competitive graduate student research, we need to be able to engage closely with industries. Our industries are still the best. And still, they have a lot of needs. Since they are always under the gun for completing their project, they would like to have a certain amount of engagement with universities. As I've shown you, that there are 28 companies a part of this within two years. So we could mimic this kind of activities across the board for all kinds of welding-related activities. And I'm sure that we can still maintain our edge with reference to graduate education. So I'd like to summarize again. 
they remember this center is not only our center. There are two other centers, similar way of working together. There is a one with reference to arc and plasma welding led by University of Virginia and also Jyoti Mazum there from Michigan. And also there is a friction stir welding research center. It's a huge and it is run out of uh, Brigham Young University also. And also South Dakota School of Mines played a crucial role in making the center big also. So we do have a mechanisms to engage with the industry and be focused on their problems such a way that the students can work on them and learn during that and also provide solutions to them. So thank you. Thank you.